Hey guys, what's going on? It's Robbie Robert here, and today I'm going to be doing a oil painting tutorial. I'll kind of do a whole walkthrough of everything from beginning an oil painting to finishing one. So, um, yeah, I'll kind of show you the tools that you'll need to get started today. Um, different colors that you'll need are, uh, well, the ones that I use specifically are cadmium yellow pale hue. Uh, we got yellow okra. Um, we have permanent alizarin crimson, or and you can either use both or either one. Um, cadmium, cadmium red hue. Uh, we got French ultramarine blue, phthalo green, and then uh, burnt sienna, or you can use uh, burnt umber and then raw umber. You can use a couple of mixture of them or all three if you want. Uh, also, uh, titanium or zinc white, and it's not always needed, but um, ivory black. Sometimes people, you can add black to some colors, but it's not always needed. Um, and then whatever brushes you prefer, you can have mixture of brushes and a palette knife. All the, all the paints that I'm using are... Uh, Windsor & Newton Artisan uh, Water mix Mixable Oil, so I won't be using turpentine, I'll be using water, which saves me money on buying turpentine, and also is a little bit better for my lungs while I'm inside of an apartment, <clears throat> or inside your studio if you have poor ventilation. Um, so yeah, let's get started with this. Alright, so today I'm going to be demoing a simple little still life setup. Um, I'll kind of walk you through every every step that I do for, uh, this goes for any type of painting. Um, there's a few different styles to do, but I'm just going to do one particular here. Um, so we're going to start off with kind of a burnt umber uh, underpainting. But I'm going to quick throw down a short little sketch of my still life that I have right now. Keep in mind when you're uh, when you're doing these still lifes, you can manipulate them however you want. Like if uh, the teapot is maybe too small for your composition, you can sometimes enlarge it, or vice versa, you can shrink it down. Don't feel constricted to paint or draw exactly what you exactly what your eye sees. I mean, it's sometimes good because. If you're trying to get um, accurate, but it's not always needed. Sort of a, a teapot, and we have an orange and a couple of apples.
can move stuff over however you want. You can enlarge it. I'm just using some oil pastels here to kind of lay down a sketch before we go in with the burnt umber underpainting here. Just drawing the cloth here. It's very important to get your sketch down, so maybe do some thumbnails before you jump in, do some color studies of the piece. <clears throat> Alright, so I kind of have my basic, my basic sketch down right now. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use our water and then you can either use burnt umber, raw umber, or burnt sienna to do um, your under painting, which I'm going to be using burnt umber. So you can use whatever brush you want. A fairly large one usually works better. And you just use water. And then if you have any, <clears throat> um, I have max medium quick dry, which you can use a little bit of that with your um, paint and your water. And they'll kind of speed up the drying process. Of your underpainting, which when you have it thinned down with water, it tends to dry within an hour or two or so. Um, so right now we're just laying in uh, blocks of color. Trying to get most of the canvas toned. You can either do the sketch before or after toning, as long as you're using something that will kind of show through. I know that these oil pastels will show through thin down paint, but sometimes if you're using pencil and stuff, it might get um, muddy and stuff. So keep in mind of what you're using. So if not, just start by covering the canvas like so first and then do your sketch over that. This is just so that I don't have any white on the canvas because you don't want to be dry brushing or something and then you have, you can see the white of the canvas because that'll, it'll make your paintings look really amateur. I don't have a bigger brush with me at the moment, but usually you can use a fairly like a one and a half or a two inch brush to cover. All right, and now since it's still kind of wet, um, so my canvas is pretty much covered right now. So now you want to get a clean rag of some sort. I have a clean rag right here. And you're going to want to wipe out where the highlights of your painting are, where the whitest spots are going to be. It doesn't have to be precise, it can be it can be 
pretty uh, sloppy with it, but you're just kind of trying to get the values down right now. When you're looking at your still life and you're trying to see value and you're trying to see where your lights, lightest lights are, your darkest darts, oh, darks are, um, you just want to squint. When you squint your eyes, it kind of narrows down to three values. You got your highlights, your middle tones, and then your darkest darks. Um, it's a really good technique to use. Because, I mean, every, anyone and everyone can do it. You can kind of all see the same with that. So I'm, I'm kind of scraping out these, these highlights. And now, once you kind of have the highlights, you can uh, you can go in with uh, thicker paint, burnt umber. And then we're going to want to uh, paint in the darkest darks. With oil painting, you want to you want to start with your darks, and then work your way up to work your way up to the uh, the highlights and the lightest parts of your painting. It's the opposite of watercolor. Watercolor, you start with the lights and then work your way to the darks, but with oil painting now, it's the opposite. Even though I'm wiping out the whites here, and that doesn't really count as starting with the darks, but... So, you want to use a little bit thicker paint here. Still kind of thin down, but not, a whole, not as much as the underpainting, because you want to work your way up to the thickest paint towards the end. So now I'm just going to kind of block in where I see the darkest darks. And remember, since you're using, you're kind of just, it's kind of like a black and white painting, but you're using a toned um, uh, actual color. People might try it with black and white, but I don't like to do this in a in a gray gray scale because it's it just has no color behind it. <clears throat> Looks very dull when you do it that way. Now keep in mind you have you have this rag handy so you can blend with it, you can kind of smudge out certain parts if you didn't like how one of the parts looked, you can go in with your rag. It's really nice. So just scoping out these dark, dark areas. trying to capture the light as accurate as possible. There might be some times in your paintings though that you might have to kind of adjust the way the light is hitting. I'll show you for example like this edge of the teapot here. I'm going to do pretty dark and then right here is light. Let's say in the still life that if that was dark on dark you can sometimes adjust that and make this a little bit lighter so it's not the same exact value so that you can kind of you can see the difference in the two shapes there. So I mean, don't don't do that with everything though. You can do that with minor adjustments to kind of adjust the lighting there. kind of give you a uh, an idea of where to put your 
lights and darks instead of painting all the prima where you just place the paint right on there and then that's what you get this you can you kind of build up your values and colors up until the very end Also when you're painting try to use try to use bigger brushes right off the start um, and then you work your way and narrow your way down to your smaller detailed brushes because if you have a painting with just a bunch of small brush strokes it's, it's not going to look that not going to look that professional here the teapot's a little bit lighter and then the ground is sitting on there's the there's the casted shadow from the teapot just always be comparing value that's what you have to do the whole the whole time you're painting you're just constantly comparing compare 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 because I mean that's the essence of the painting is finding these little little subtle differences that are gonna Little subtle differences in light and color, and that's what's going to make your painting stand out when you really capture those nuances there. I'm probably going to break this video up. In a couple different, um, couple different parts, might get a little too long. Give me some feedback though. Let me know if you guys like, uh, if you like this style of commentary, or if you'd rather have it just completely sped up, and then I just kind of talk for like five minutes over that. Or if this step by step is really helping. I just want you guys to be able to take away from it and actually learn and get out there and try some some painting techniques. Still working a little bit more on the darks here, but then pretty soon you can add white onto your palette and uh, and mix in that umber or sienna, whatever you're using, with white, and then and then build up the values because I mean I already have a lot of different values going on here. I got the really dark. Got some middle tone and then a little bit lighter than the middle tone, which is acting as a highlight right now. But I want to step in with a little bit brighter than that. So then when that dries, I can go in with color right over that. And when I pull color over the highlight, it's going to make that color really bright and vibrant. <clears throat> This is a very important step though because if you don't get this down right and you don't get your values down right 
I mean, it's the foundation for your whole painting, so it's very, very important to get this accurate as close as you can. And then another reason for that you paint the darks first is because if you were to paint light highlights first and then go over with the darks, um, it usually gets pretty muddy for some reason. But when you, if you paint the darks first and then you go over with the whites, um, they stay pretty true to their tones and values. Because you can, I could paint this dark and then I could come with a big streak of, I don't know, purple or something, a lighter purple over it, and it's not going to really muddy, mud up with the other colors there. The value here is kind of close in the actual thing there. It's okay sometimes too to have the same value touching two different objects. You can just change the color too, but that's called uh, closure. That's kind of what they call it. So you could have, I could kind of have the base of the teapot kind of fading in, and right in here with these apples and orange, and the teapot they kind of blend together. Sorry if I get kind of quiet, <laughs> focusing too much. Always looking at light, composition, angles. There's a lot that goes through the, through the thought process when trying to get a good looking painting. Alright, I'm going to let this dry just a little bit. Since it's pretty thin paint, it'll dry pretty quick. But uh, I want that dry a little bit, I'll come back and then I'll kind of start the highlights and the rest of the underpainting and I'll show you the rest of that. Alright, uh, the lighting may have changed due to my window and the time of day now. Um, I'm going to just continue with uh, with this underpainting, now I'm going to be adding white to uh, add a little bit thicker paint for the highlights. So I'm still just using uh, white and burnt umber. So, like I said, though, you can use burnt sienna or raw, or excuse me, I'm using raw umber, but you can use burnt umber or burnt sienna. I'm going to use a little bit smaller of a brush. Using some water and quick dry if you have some, just to sort of speed up the process. I'm just going in and kind of fixing up some of these mid values. I usually like to work with. Uh, with um, burnt sienna because it kind of gives a nice reddish tint. Um, gives a really good overall tone to the whole painting. Here, I'm just 
just adjusting some of the values. This apple has them. Let's see, uh, probably need more weight. I'll kind of throw in some basic tips and stuff. Um, when you're painting or drawing, try to break up, if there, even if there is a straight line, like let's say this cloth went straight down, try to break it up, have it continue in like the same direction that it normally is, but don't have just a straight line, have it a broken sort of line, thick and thin too. That would really improve your paintings, but I'm sure most of you Hopefully you already know that. Remember to hold your brush pretty far back on it. Um, a lot of people starting out will like paint like this, like using a pencil, but you really want to hold it like this or even like this. And you can kind of, I don't know, it's just, it's a lot more natural to do that now than to hold it like a pencil. And that way you can stand pretty far back while looking at the whole painting as you're able to lay down paint at the same time. starting to kind of probably get pretty close to finishing up the underpainting here.
adding the final white, white, white highlights. This will make it very easy for me when I start up the color portion of the painting because I already have all my values down so then I just have to match up my colors with the values and or you can also glaze which I'll show you in case you don't know what glazing is. Um, I can show you that technique. So some people Instead of just using thick paint over this, they'll wait for it to dry and then they glaze straight over the underpainting and I'll just keep the values, which I will do in some parts, but some parts I'll add thicker paint completely over it. about done with this underpainting. Try not to try to keep if if there's like big blocks of solid color, try to break that up for solid value, try to have variance in the values, which we'll also do with the color. You just don't want too much of the same thing, otherwise you just have big solid blocks everywhere with no definition of shape or form. I think this might be just about done. I can always, you'll always be able to go back and reshape stuff once we start adding color and all that so nothing is set in stone as is but
think that looks pretty decent for for the start of an underpainting. So uh, I'll probably end that video here and I'll start up a new one for the second portion. So make sure to stay tuned. I'll have the second portion uploaded hopefully a day or two after this one's put up. So thanks for watching guys. Um, stay tuned for part two. If you have any comments to give before part two, go ahead and shoot them my way. Alright, thanks.